everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. In today's video, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the Koreathon cycle, prophecy, the most important prophecy in the Wheel of Time. We'll be doing a line-by-line -line breakdown of the meaning and significance to the story, basically just figuring out what it all means. This video was voted on by my patrons over on Patreon, so thank you to everybody over there supporting me. I'll talk more about it later, but it's been a while since we've run any contests here on the channel. For those of you who are new, I occasionally like to run contests to give away real-world prizes to viewers. To date, I've given away a couple different Wheel of Time hardback books. I've decided it's not only time for a new contest, but to up the game, given that the channel's grown a lot here lately. So we're going to do it in a super fun way. Make sure to stay tuned to the very end of the video to get details on the contest, how it's going to work, and how you can get involved in it. Now before diving into the Prophecies of the Dragon with you, let's throw up a spoiler warning for the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler warning of red, meaning it will contain major spoilers all the way through A Memory of Light, Please watch at your own risk. So what is the Corythian Cycle? Most readers know it as the prophecies of the dragon, the prophecies that predict the coming and actions of the dragon reborn in his battle against the shadow. But how do they come into being? What are they? And most importantly, what the heck do they mean in the story? Well, the Corythian Cycle is just a piecing together of a number of different foretellings from before, during, and after the War of Power and the Breaking of the World. They are meant to give signs of the dragon's return, and signs of the inevitable confrontation with the Dark One. Many of the excerpts from the prophecies are cryptic and difficult to determine the meaning, but we'll do our best to try to go line by line and break it all down, and figure out which parts came true in the books, and if they did, how did they come true? So to keep this video short, rather than me reading the entire cycle as I was planning on doing, which would take like 10 minutes by itself, we're just going to go line by line and break down different parts of it in order as they go. So let's start here. And it shall come to pass that what men made shall be shattered, and the shadow shall lie across the pattern of the age, and the dark one shall once more lay his hand on the world of man. Women shall weep and men quail as the nations of the earth are rent like rotting cloth. Neither shall anything stand or abide. All right, so this first section is fairly straightforward. Essentially, there will come a time when the Dark One is going to be touching the world. And there's some foreshadowing about the way the Dark One would try and destroy the world, much like we see at the end of the novels. The weather becomes crazy, food becomes scarce, people starve, there are riots, etc. The shadow shall rise across the world and darken every land, even the smallest corner, and there shall be neither light nor safety. And he who shall be born of the dawn, born of the maiden, according to prophecy, he shall stretch forth his hand and catch the shadow, and the world shall scream in the pain of salvation. All glory be to the Creator, and to the Light, and to he who shall be born again. May the Light save us from him." So here we get some more on the Shadow's effect on the world, essentially showing that the Dark One's reach and the depth of the destruction that he would cause. We get to see our first mention of the Dragon Reborn. We get clues about his birth, but not the birth as you might read it. This is not talking about his physical birth, but rather his confirmation as he who comes with the Dawn. He is born of a maiden and returned from Shandier at dawn with Matt after going to Roydian. This is when he confronts the wise ones, and they anoint him he who comes with the dawn. The lines, the world shall scream in the pain of salvation, and may the light save us from him, reiterate the point that the dragon would save the world and destroy it at the same time. Yet one shall be born to face the shadow, born once more as he was born before, and shall be born again, time without end. The dragon shall be reborn, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth at his rebirth. In sackcloth and ashes shall he clothe the people, and he shall break the world again by his coming, tearing apart the ties that bind. Like the unfettered dawn shall he bind us, and burn us. Yet shall the dragon reborn confront the shadow at the last battle, and his blood shall give us the light. Let tears flow, O ye people of the world, Weep for your salvation. So here we get some more lines about the dragon being born to face the shadow and the breaking of the world that he would cause. Sackcloth and ashes are terms used in the Bible quite often, and they're used to indicate repentance and humility. Sackcloth was uncomfortable to wear and was worn to show that you were atoning for sin. I think in this case, clothing the people in sackcloth and ashes indicates a general uncomfort that we're going to have with the dragon's coming, that he would truly disrupt the order of society. This is something that Rand very clearly does in the books. There is a line in this passage that is quoted often within the books that the dragon would tear apart all ties that bind. This is repeated throughout and is used by Masima often to do whatever he wanted, basically, as the dragon had broken all ties and bonds. On the slopes of Dragon Mount shall he be born, born of a maiden wedded to no man. He will be of the ancient blood, but raised by the old blood. When the winds of Tarmangaiden scour the earth, 
He will face the shadow and bring forth light again into the world. For he shall come like the breaking dawn and shatter the world again with his coming and make it anew. Here is the basic information on Rand's actual birth and upbringing. He was born of Tigraine, who had become a maiden of the spear, and then he was born on the slopes of Dragonmount. Tigraine had not married Janduin, the clan chief of the Tardad Aiel, as she would have had to put down the spear and not be a maiden of the spear anymore. Instead, she carried his baby, and they were lovers, but she was wedded to no man. He was born of the ancient blood of the Aiel, descendant all the way back to the original Aiel from the Age of Legends. But he was raised raised by the people of the Two Rivers in Tam Al Thor. The Two Rivers is descendant from the people of Manethrin, which is referred to as the Old Blood in the books. The Winds of Tarman Gaiden is an apt description of what was going on in the World of Dreams during the last battle, as it was described by the Winds wiping reality from existence within the World of Dreams. The line about bringing forth light again into the world is something that we see Rand do a lot when he hits his Zen state at the end of the books, breaking the clouds and bringing sunshine and light where there had previously only been clouds and darkness. Twice and twice shall he be marked, twice to live and twice to die. Once the heron to set his path, twice the heron to name him true, once the dragon for remembrance lost, twice the dragon for the price he must pay. These are the lines that mark Rand as the dragon reborn and show the world who he is. He is to be marked twice, twice basically. The first time he's marked, it's in the World of Dreams. Ishamael attacks Rand in the World of Dreams, and Rand holds on to Tam's heron-marked blade. The fire sears a heron onto Rand's hand, and when he awakens, this actually scars him permanently. Rand had no idea of the significance at that time. The second time he's marked, it's after a battle with Ishamael in the sky over Fulma. He again wields Tam's sword in the fight, and the one power sears another heron onto his other hand. This is the first time he was publicly acknowledged as the Dragon Reborn, hence marking him true. The second time he is marked starts with his trip to Roideon and his time seeing the past of the Aiel and the price that he must pay at Sheogul. This time he comes out marked with dragons on his arms. Five ride forth and four return. Above the watchers over the waves shall he proclaim himself, bannered cross the sky and fire. This is a reference to the very end of the Great Hunt. Before entering Falma to go after Pat and Fane in the horn and the dagger, they take volunteers and sneak into the city. Perrin, Rand, Matt, Huron, and Ingtar all volunteer to enter the city, and then Varen refuses to allow anyone else to go because of this prophecy. Ingtar doesn't return as he dies during the battle, revealing to Rand that he was a dark friend and sacrificing himself to attempt to atone for sins. The above the watchers over the waves shall he proclaim himself line refers to Rand's fight with Ishamael in the sky over Falma that all witnessed. This is the first time Rand raises the dragon banner and the heroes of the horn ride behind his banner. The stone of Tyr will never fall till Kalindor is wielded by the dragon's hand. The stone of Tyr will never fall till the people of the dragon come. Into the heart he thrusts the sword, into the heart to hold their hearts. Who draws it out shall follow after, what hand can grasp that fearful blade? These lines tell of the fall of the Stone of Tear being one of the signs of the dragon's return. We see through the history of the Wheel of Time that many false dragons attempt to take the Stone of Tear to prove this. Rand was the first to actually do that. Kalindor will be wielded by the dragon's hand and he will take the Stone of Tear with the help of the people of the dragon, which are the Aiel. He later drives Kalindor into the stone to keep the High Lords of Tear fearful of his return and that they will observe the laws that he changed as he leaves to go to the Aiel Waste. Who draws it out shall follow after refers to Jahar Narishma returning to Tyr and drawing out the sword for Rand prior to his battle with the Shanchan. Power of the shadow made human flesh, wakened to turmoil, strife, and ruin. The reborn one, marked and bleeding, dances the sword in dreams and mist, chains the shadow sworn to his will. From the city, lost and forsaken, leads the spears to war once more, breaks the spears and makes them see, truth long hidden in ancient dream. He shall slay his people with the sword of peace and destroy them with the leaf. So the power of the shadow made human flesh refers to the very first bubble of evil in the Stone of Tear, where Rand's reflections in the mirror turn into clones of himself and they fight him. The reborn one, marked and bleeding, dances the sword in dreams and mist, refers to the bubble of evil that Rand and Matt experience while in the mists of Roideon. Chains the shadow sworn to his will from the city lost and forsaken refers to Rand's defeat of Asmodian by cutting him off to access to the Dark One and forcing him to follow Rand while they're both in the lost city of Roideon. The last part about leading the spears and making them see the truth long hidden in the ancient dream refers to Rand telling all of the Aiel about the history he learned while in the glass columns, 
of the Ayo people, and the time that they once followed the way of the leaf. This is what leads to the line of slaying his people with the sword of peace and destroying them with the leaf. With his coming are the dread fires born again, the hills burn, and the land turns sear. The tides of men run out, and the hours dwindle. The wall is pierced, and the veil of parting raised. Storms rumble beyond the horizon, and the fires of heaven purge the earth. There is no salvation without destruction, no hope this side of death. These lines are either a reference to the Shido invasion of Kyrian again, or just another reference to the Dragon Reborn's coming and the destruction that accompanies him. This is one of the first times we see the title of a book, in the prophecy, something that we're going to see a few more times. The unstained tower, broken, bends knee to the forgotten sign. The seas rage and the storm clouds gather unseen. Beyond the horizon, hidden fires swell and serpents nestle in the bosom. What was exalted is cast down. What was cast down is raised up. Order burns to clear his path. These lines refer to the aftermath of Demise Wells as the Aes Sedai from the Tower faction and the Rebel faction both bend knee to Rand and the Dragon Banner. We also get language implying that the Aes Sedai that have exalted themselves continually throughout the series have been cast down and humbled by Rand, who has been captured, beat, and humiliated, and he is raised up above them and becomes the new order rather than the Aes Sedai giving order. There can be no health in us, nor any good thing grow, for the land is one with the Dragon Reborn, and he is one with the land. Soul of fire, heart of stone, in pride he conquers, forcing the proud to yield. He calls upon the mountains to kneel, and the seas to give way, and the very skies to bow. Pray that the heart of stone remembers tears, the soul of fire, love. This is essentially more description of the Dragon Reborn's coming and how he forces the proud Aes Sedai and rulers to yield, but yet he conquers in pride himself. The last part there stating that they should pray he remembers tears and love is essentially what Cad Swain's quest was, that she needed to teach Rand and the Ashermen something. This is also how the Borderlanders test Rand in the Towers of Midnight, making sure that he does remember tears and isn't crazy anymore. As the plow breaks in the earth shall he break the lives of men, and all that was shall be consumed in the fire of his eyes. The trumpets of war shall sound at his footsteps, the ravens feed at his voice, and he shall wear a crown of swords. Master of lightnings, rider on the storm, wearer of a crown of swords, spinner out of fate, who thinks he turns the wheel of time, may learn truth too late. These lines are another time we see the book title within the prophecy. These are descriptions of Rand and his power, but also his pride and arrogance. The line about him thinking that he turns the wheel of time is so true, and that he might learn the truth too late. This is part of that journey that Rand goes through in self-discovery and eventually turning into Zen Rand. The seals that hold back the night shall weaken, and in the heart of winter shall winter's heart be born. Amid the wailings and lamentation and gnashing of teeth, for winter's heart shall ride a black horse, and the name of it is death. These lines appear to refer to the coming of Moradin and his leadership of the shadow. Moradin literally means death in the old tongue and he dresses in black. And also here's another time that we get to see a book title in prophecy with Winter's Heart. And it shall come to pass in the days when the dark hunt rides, when the right hand falters and the left hand strays, that mankind shall come to the crossroads of twilight. And all that is, all that was, and all that will be shall balance on the point of a sword, while the winds of the shadow grow. He shall heal the wounds of madness and cutting of hope. He shall hold a blade of light in his hands, and the three shall be one. He shall bind the nine moons to serve him. The north shall he tie to the east, and the west shall he bound to the south. I love these lines as they basically show Rand's sanity and his humanity were on the brink of collapse at a crossroads, basically, until he was able to merge with Luz Theron and become the Zen Rand that we later see. Healing the wounds of madness and the cutting of hope seem to refer to his cleansing of Sidene and giving hope for those that can channel Sidene as they actually might live rather than just being tools. Binding the nine moons to serve him seems to refer to bring the Shan Chan and the Daughter of Nine Moons into the battle for the last battle. He basically unites the world against the shadow right before the end. Twice dawns the day when his blood is shed, once for mourning, once for birth. Red on black, the dragon's blood stains the rocks of Sheol Ghul. In the pit of doom shall his blood free men from the shadow. His blood on the rocks of Sheol Ghul, washing away the shadow, sacrifice for man's salvation. He shall break chains and put others into chains. Fortune rides like the sun on high with the fox that makes the ravens fly. Luck his soul, the lightning his eye, he snatches up moons from out of the sky. When the wolf king carries the hammer, thus are the final days known. When the fox marries the raven and the trumpets of battle are blown. And these last lines refer to his defeat of the dark one in the last battle. He dies at Sheogul 
his blood staining the rocks where he was in the Pit of Doom. The last lines refer to the other Taviran boys, Matt and Perrin. Matt is the fox that makes the ravens fly with luck in his soul, he has a missing eye, and he snatches moons out of the sky, referring to his marriage with Tuan, who was the daughter of the Nine Moons. Perrin is clearly the Wolf King as he carrying his new hammer. The trumpets of battle being blown can also be a reference to the Horn of Valir at the last battle. So guys, that's my breakdown of the very long Carithian cycle. Uh, what did you think about the breakdown? Did you interpret any of it differently? Please let me know in the comments below. And so I promised that I would let you guys know about the upcoming contest that we're going to be running on the channel. So we're going to be hosting a real life virtual game of Wheel of Time Jeopardy with a real prize. I'm gonna be selecting two contestants to go up against Daniel Green. We'll record the audio and play the game off, not live, and then I'll post the video after I edit it up a little bit. But the winner's gonna receive a prize package that's mailed out to them with a copy of one of the Wheel of Time hardback books, a special shout out in an upcoming video, and the ability to pick the topic for one of my videos in the near future. Here's how you can register to be picked to play in the game. One of my Discord moderators, MK, has started a new Facebook group to discuss the series and really keep growing the Wheel of Time community in different mediums. You can start by requesting to join that group. I'll have that posted in the description below. Then you post your Wheel of Time story on the group page. Let me know how you found the books, what your experience has been, and why you love them. We'll have two folks picked out to go against Daniel Green in our first ever Wheel of Time Jeopardy. The link to the Facebook page is in the description below, so all you have to do is get in there and post what your Wheel of Time story is, and that's how you can get entered into the contest. Please like the video if you're enjoying the content, and make sure to subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new content. Also, make sure to check out my Patreon if you want to support what I'm doing here. Thank you guys all so much for watching, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on the rope of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free. Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?